we warmly welcome participants to breaking gender barriers in the boardroom. According to the Harvard Business Review, having women on the corporate board of companies make significant contributions that men are less likely to make, such as broadening the discussion of the board to better represent the concerns of a wide set of stakeholders, including employees, customers, and the community at large. The discussion will highlight the importance of gender equality in the boardroom to achieve SDG 5 and how to influence the largest shareholders in the board to advocate for gender equality. Simultaneous Sinhala and Tamil language interpretations will be available throughout this virtual event, and we encourage all attendees to utilize this facility if preferred. The interpretation option is available at the bottom portion of your screen. This session is interactive, and we encourage attendees to use the Q&A function to propose to pose questions to the session panelists. Please tag UN Global Compact Network Sri Lanka and your participation in MGGLB Sri Lanka when sharing on social media. The Network Sri Lanka social media handles will be available in the chat box throughout the course of the session. It is with pleasure we welcome the following panelists to this session. Mr. Hiran Kure is the current chairman of Jetwing Symphony PLC, which comes under the Jetwing family of hotels and will be the brand's vehicle for future investment and growth in the leisure sector. Ms. Sarah Nips is the officer in charge and deputy regional director of UN Women Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. Her work has focused on gender, violence against women, HIV, youth issues, and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Ms. Pavitra Samarasinghe is Director of Finance of A. Bauer & Company Private Limited and served on the board since 2016. She handled various positions in the finance department, covering all business segments in the company and her current scope is finance, legal and compliance. Mr. Tothatri Vaikuntham is Resident Director and Center Head, HCL Technologies Sri Lanka. Under his able leadership, HCL Technologies Sri Lanka has already gained global traction as more and more global customers of HCL Technologies are being supported from this island of idea partners. Mr. Tatatri is also part of SASCOM's General Council. Ms. Shamali Vikramasinghe is the Group Managing Director of CBL Group. Presently, she is a member of EDB's Advisory Committee on Processed Food and Beverages, Council of the Employers Federation of Ceylon, board on the board of Amcham Sri Lanka and also on the board of United States Sri Lanka Fulbright Commission. The moderator for this session is Ms. Dinali Piris, Director, Group Human Resources at MAS Holdings and serves as a board member on the MAS Holdings Apparel Board and its Sustainable, Sustainability Advisory Committee. She also serves as a board member of the UN Global Compact Network Sri Lanka. Ms. Dinali Priyavis, over to you to commence the session. Hello, everyone, and a very good afternoon to you from Colombo, Sri Lanka. It is my absolute pleasure to be moderating this esteemed panel discussion, discussing the topic of breaking gender barriers in the boardroom, a topic very close to my heart. Through the conscious drive to increase women's participation in senior leadership that we see globally, we can pinpoint the starkest indicators of gender inequality, the lack of voice at the highest decision-making levels of the world, and the unequal access to wealth. The research from McKinsey Global, Catalyst, Deloitte, all highlight the business benefits of diverse boards, and especially better gender representation on boards. We see correlation between better gender representation and financial performance, innovation, corporate governance, and overall better environmental, social, and governance indicators. Companies now have a clear reason to drive active interventions to increase female representation on boards and across all work levels. So if this is the case, why do the numbers say something different? Women still only make up approximately 22% of public company boards globally, 
and the Standard and Poor 500 companies have a 6% representation of female CEOs. One of the most common statements we hear in conversations about underrepresentation is that there are not enough women who are board ready. I would ask that we question what do we mean by board ready and whether we hold any of our biases relating to who has held these positions before. Further, our ability to look beyond that also becomes important. Companies and countries that have progressed in this space have looked at different skills and exposure that people bring to the board rather than the same financial acumen, business knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. Lord Davis, who is an ex-trade minister in the UK and drove a great agenda to increase women in leadership and politics, talks about looking at women who have engaged in major social and environmental organizations, done philanthropy work, managed home businesses to bring in different perspectives to these organizations. The Chartered Institute for Accountants worked on a list of board ready women. So did the IFC in Sri Lanka. With all the progress we have made in terms of education for women, and certainly a shift in mindset towards bridging the gap on gender stereotypes, women still carry majority of the childcare and home care responsibility world over. The pandemic has aggravated the burnout that women are feeling because of the double burden. Recognizing the social, cultural, and historic reasons that are holding talented women from leading our business is crucial and critical if we want to be the leaders in our industry. Today, we are facilitating those conversations and understanding what more can we be doing. As mentioned by Sanda Giambo, Executive Director of the United Nations Global Compact at the opening plenary, the MGGLB session is a rally to action. Comprising of 60 speakers, equally, equally split between 30 men and 30 women. So as we discuss breaking gender barriers in the boardroom, let's hear from our esteemed pa panel on their views on this subject and topic, I'm sure which is of much interest and conversation. So I'd like to begin with Sarah, who will be sharing her thoughts on the need for gender equality in the boardroom and why this is so important if we are to achieve our sustainable development goal number five of achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls. Sara, over to you. Thank you so much, Denali. And let me begin by saying it's really an honor to be on this very distinguished panel and really delightful to be joining you virtually in Sri Lanka. I wish I was really there with you. Um, so we're here together this afternoon to talk about um, how to harness actions to really advance the SDGs and especially SDG 5. And we know that a really key part of SDG 5 is ensuring that women reach the highest levels of leadership across the board. But that includes, of course, the private sector. So I just want to begin by saying that, you know, this is why this kind of gathering is so important, because the SDGs are everyone's business. And we really do need, you know, the strong participation of the private sector, as well as the public sector, you know, the UN, non-governmental sectors and the population in general. So as Denali already highlighted, we have a lot of evidence to show us that women's active participation and decision making in the economy is really crucial to long term economic prosperity. In 2019, for example, the World Bank's International Finance Corporation analyzed actually more than a thousand companies across ASEAN countries. Um, and it showed that companies with more than 30% women in the board actually performed much better financially than those that had less than 30% women in the board and even better and the, the, the gap was even larger with those who had no women on the board so 
I don't want to go into all of the studies we have that say this. In fact, there are actually over 90 studies and reports from different countries, different organizations and contexts, which consistently show there's a correlation between having more women in the board in decision making positions and better financial performance of companies. But as Denali also alluded to, the benefits of gender diversity, and I think it's very important to say this is about diversity. It's not just about men and women. It's about really thinking about who are those men and who are those women who have access to decision-making roles. But the benefits of this diversity do extend far beyond straightforward economic measures that we can easily you know, put into a balance sheet. We know that female board members are really seen as having positive impacts on board's monitoring capabilities, bringing different viewpoints and skill sets in successfully engaging all kinds of stakeholders and introducing different leadership styles. In fact, the presence of women in leadership positions is also linked to overall employee satisfaction and there are connections there to a more productive workforce and contribution to company growth. And regional experts have, have concluded from all of this evidence that diversity on a board can really improve performance and increase innovation. So, these are uh, clearly, these are all benefits that I think all of us would want to see. But yet we're well aware that there are persistent barriers that hamper women's full economic participation, their employment in general, and their progression to leadership roles and board membership. For example, in 2018, women held less than 17% of board seats and less than 5% of CEO positions worldwide. And I think all of us often in our working lives, you know, we, we don't need to see data. We, we see the evidence of this all too often. And then, of course, the global pandemic and the realities that we've all been living through over the last one and a half to two years have really, I think, illustrated very, very graphically the disproportionate impact on women and girls of crises. And this has had both an immediate and a long term impact on women's opportunity to really climb through the ranks to these suite positions and to board positions. And one of the things that I think has come home to us most starkly during this time, and I think we really have to take this as an opportunity because it means we're talking about something that perhaps we didn't talk about enough before, is the very unequal distribution of care burden. That means that it's all too often women who are taking care of children, who are looking after people who are unwell and sick, who are taking care of household work, and you know we saw this i think very starkly when we were all trying as i actually trying still today to work from home and juggle many different kinds of responsibilities and we really saw that this this affects everyone but data shows us that it has affected women much more strongly than men and we note that um you know throughout the life cycle we see these impacts on women and particularly we see after women have children there tends to be a kind of mid-career it's called sometimes a leaky pipe where women who would be in the pipeline for career progression are leaving the workforce um, because it's just too hard to balance those responsibilities and the social and cultural expectations and this is not special to asia pacific it's very much I'm from the UK, it's very strong in my own country too, this expectation that really in the end of the day, it's women that carry all these things and it's often not even questioned. So I think it's really fantastic that during the, the all the very hard things that have happened during the pandemic, I think it's really good that we have been talking much, much more about this. So I see that I only have one more minute to go. I'm very sorry, colleagues. I'm the person I could talk about this for a long time. So I think I just want to then um, conclude by just saying that um, I've talked a little bit about the barriers, but I also I, I think we're so lucky that this afternoon we're going to be hearing from um, real practitioners from across the business community who will share examples of the things that they've done. But I just want to really conclude by saying that we know that um, change is very much possible in terms of making more pathways for women. This could include looking at the selection processes we have, sometimes formalizing them, um, addressing some of the barriers such as care work, making sure we keep really better data about women and men's progression so that we can really trace what's actually happening. If we can't measure it, you know, it's difficult for us to address it. And I think, you know, we can all play a role in trying to combat gender stereotyping and biases. I know that's something that the panel will be talking about this afternoon. And it's incredibly important in this that we have not only women working on this issue, but it's also great that we have a, a panel with women and men as advocates this afternoon, because we need the support and advocacy of men and women working together in this. 
Um, and so I will close there, but thank you very much, Sinali, and I look forward to um, further opportunities to interact through the, the Q&A later. Thank you so much. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah, for those opening remarks. And in your session, you spoke about diversity and diversity not just being about men and women, but true diversity. And I think that would make a great segue into our next panelist, Shyamali, who's going to share the importance of thought diversity at the boardroom. Shyamali, over to you. Shyamali, you may still be on mute. You may need to unmute your mic. Sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Um, as Sarah said, you know, diversity is, um, is not only a function of gender, but many other factors um, such as race, religion, geography, experience. Um, it's a whole gamut of things. But um, for this discussion, we are going to focus um, on, on gender diversity. And um, when I look at um, experience, so we are essentially a manufacturing company. And um, when, when I look at the needs of what our board, you know, we, we have representation of women on our board, but when I look at it going forward, there is a lot of opportunity. Um, but there are also things that have to change. And I think one of the big things that need to happen is, is a cultural change in organizations. Um, they, they cannot, you know, you cannot just look at your, your board positions, but actually you have to look at your entire organization. And I think it also starts um, from the point of recruitment. I, I think um, we heard uh, mention that board ready um, women, but I feel there is a process um, to this also, and it is very important to create a, a nurturing, empowering environment where women can um, see the opportunities they have in a career should they um, decide to pursue it. Um, taking a, an example from, from ourselves, I, I feel in, in our company, we, we have no discrimination um, when we employ people. But nevertheless, when you look at female representation in senior positions, not only in the board, it's, it's, it could be better. And then I look and, and see um, when, when we um, hire for senior positions, the choice of um, candidates that we have, there are much fewer women applying than men. So I think there are fundamental um, um, shifts that need to take place. And within our organization, for example, to try and bring this diversity all the way up to the board, one of the things we're trying to do is right from the bottom, from our junior management to middle to senior, is to outline opportunities and create an environment for women to have a voice, to have confidence, um, so that they can pursue um, higher career achievements. So, um, we are in manufacturing, um, and sadly, when we um, actually um, uh, had um, vacancies, say at CEO level, most of the applications that we get have been um, male applications, and partly because of the nature of our business, um, to have a rounding understanding of the business, we feel operations and sales are two functions experience in these two functions are important, um, for example. So, uh, I mean, we are looking to see how we change the shift and we're, we're very pleased. So we um, have a young executive in, in our organization who joined, who joined the business in, in the quality assurance department, for example, and she has ambitions to, to, to do greater things. And so now today we have our first manufacturing um, position held by a female um, senior executive. So, you know, we, we have to start making these changes within the organization if we want it to go all the way to a board. Whether we like it or not, um, still in recruitment, not only in Sri Lanka, but even globally, um, there is very much an all, bar, all boys network in, in recruitment. Um, you know, what school you went to, what universities you attended. I, I think in today's context of business, um, 
I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, the the bottom line is also important. And for businesses to thrive, this diversity is important. Um, and I think it's important that more and more businesses take cognizance of this and actually work um, actively to have a transformation within their organizations to change the way we do things, starting from recruitment to also giving a, a voice to women. Um, in most forums, for example, uh, they do tend to be, um, the, the voice tends to be um, skewed to a, to a male one. And it, it, it's, it can be quite intimidating. So we need to prepare um, our um, women um, executives as senior, you know, to, to be able to deal with these environments and, and carry this voice forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shyamali, for sharing your thoughts and your perspectives. And you made some very interesting statements. You spoke about the importance of organizations creating an environment which is empowering and nurturing. And you spoke about change, change that's required in organizations if we are to make this shift. So with that, I'd like to move on to our next panelist, Totatri, who uh, is going to share with us, how do we influence this change? How do we influence the largest shareholders, the leadership in a company to advocate for gender equality? So Tatri, over to you. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> Bowen to all from Sri Lanka. It's a pleasure to be here uh, along with all other esteemed colleagues, part of the He for She campaign. You know, when I think about the uh, he for she and the topic that you've given, uh, in my opinion, as an individual, what is it that we need to do? I think there is nothing special that uh, we need to do, right? Uh, uh, what, I, what I mean by that is that we don't need to be chasing numbers, percentage, and KPI, right? Many of the leaders have a, a KPP to have a diversity uh, percentage as a part of the team. I think what's very important is that as an organization, we have a, a, a very clear process. We encourage very open communication across the organization. And to an extent where this becomes an innate behavior of all the employees in the company, and obviously it's a continuous process, right? It's not a, a very sh short one year or a few months process. Uh, let me talk about my own experience uh, in the last one year or so. Uh, we opened our operations um, in Sri Lanka last year, around uh, September. So it's been a, it's been a year uh, since we just crossed our first 1,100 employees um, in uh, Sri Lanka. The core operations team that we have uh, in SEL Sri Lanka currently has close to around 60% um, uh, employees who are females. Many business functions are led by women employees in Sri Lanka. While I think we are very proud of um, the percentage and the gender diversity that we, have, that we have achieved, what I think we are really proud of is that, as I said, we have done nothing special. Um, we just picked the right candidates from the market and this is an organic state um, where we are currently. My own personal experience, uh, I currently, uh, my reporting manager is a, is a woman. She is the corporate vice president of uh, HCL Technologies. And her reporting manager is the, is the current chairperson, Roshni Nadar Malhotra of HCL Technologies, right, based in Delhi. Um, while I think they deserve the place that um, they have reached, I think they would definitely agree with me. Um, what's, I think, even more important is that they chose to be up there. And they desired and aspired for those those positions. By the way, we uh, used to refer to this position as chairman. Till around a few months back, we just got over <laughs> and got used to uh, the position uh, to be renamed as chairperson, a more inclusive terms, right? Uh, inclusive term. I do think we have a, a long way to go uh, in achieving gender neutrality. Uh, in many organizations, many industries, including ours. Right? Uh, um, some of the programs as an organization that we run, um, we have um, focused career development programs for uh, budding leaders to get into a business leader. We have 
career development programs for senior leaders, women leaders, um, to become uh, take on much higher leadership roles. We have focused mentorship programs and sponsors from senior VPs and above. We sponsor uh, high potential women candidates. Um, I'm sure many other corporates have uh, similar programs. But as I said, I think it's very critical that we have a consistent, open communication about this with all the employees and encourage employees to participate in inclusion initiatives. Um, going back a few years back, right, my first um, diversity and inclusion experience, I was pulled into a, a diversity program initiative. And frankly, my thinking at that time was, um, are we compromising the role? Are we compromising the quality that is required that needs to be a part of the team? Um, and I'm talking about uh, 12 years back, right? The first um, exercise um, where all the managers are called in. And as I said, there is a very elaborate communication program in our, in our company. We need to be uh, very clear that uh, we are not compromising on the quality, but it might, we talked about recruitment earlier, right? It, it might take a few more um, interviews. It might take a few more, a few effort more. Uh, we will have to screen a few candidates. We probably have to have a patience as well, right? To achieve what we want to achieve. Internally, I think there are quite a lot of internal uh, positions that, uh, you know, internal employees whom we, uh, we, we choose. And it's very important that as an organization, we are very open to spend the effort to mentor, coach our own employees. I talked about a few programs it's been running, diversity and inclusion programs have been running for uh, close to 15 years right now. Uh, so the result of uh, this, I'm again, uh, quite a few of uh, my previous panel members talked about, is pretty much uh, a no brainer, right? There are quite a lot of uh, reports, quite a lot of insights, um, uh, research analysts' papers, which tells us that organizations benefit hugely uh, when you have diversity. My own personal experience of having a, a very gender diverse team, uh, and you have a senior woman leader in the in the meeting, it automatically means that, you know, we have much higher discipline, we have a more democratic process, um, right? And uh, we have a, uh, we, we also learn to be more assertive than be aggressive all the time. Um, so these are, and, and it also brings a diverse thought leadership into the, into the, uh, the teams. Um, so it's very important it's also very important to have uh, a general neutral policy at a, at a company level. Obviously, um, a lot of uh, flexible work timings, work from home options, wherever possible. Not all job roles, uh, uh, we are able to do that, but wherever possible, um, daycare facilities, et cetera. But I think the focus of setting up policies should be to create a level playing field in the, in the, in the company. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tathatri, uh, for your for your thoughts and 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 for some of the interventions that have uh, resulted in influencing uh, the leadership and the board to advocate for gender equality. And you you spoke about some interesting uh, interventions from uh, mentorship, sponsorship, career development, and a lot of those programs and those interventions are about helping uh, women acquire new competence, acquire new skill sets, um, look at behavior, et cetera, and progress their journeys in the organization. And with that, what I would like to do now is to invite Pavitra uh, to share her experience about the behavioral changes that are required as we progress through the organization at various levels of leadership, and especially the behavioral changes that are required when you get to the board position. Pavitra, over to you. Thank you, Dinali. Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, a pleasure to be here today. Uh, uh, when I look at the behavioral changes required at the various level, I would say uh, when you are serving on the board or even uh, any, any other leadership position, 
you would have to consider a bigger picture, a 360 degree view uh, without any blind spot, as uh, you will be leading a group of people uh, who are going to achieve or trying to achieve the common objective. So the board directors are generally selected uh, for the expertise in areas relevant to the organization and they are specialists or experts in their own domain. A technical uh, specialty or the domain knowledge may be finance, HR, IT will surely be represented at the board level for decision making purpose. However, at the board, one would have to have that extensive knowledge about the business of the organization and the business environment, both micro and macro. So uh, that business acumen would evolve you from a technical expert or a technical specialist to a holistic business lead, especially when you're uh, at the board where you are responsible, your responsibility would be for the overall strategy of the organization. And also when you're in leadership positions, you will need to place the interest of your team uh, or your organization to achieve a common goal or the objective before your own interest or personal uh, objective. So when you progress to uh, board positions, I think it's extremely important that you need to forego your ego. So that urge for individual accomplishment and the thought process and how you react to certain things would transform to organization's accomplishment or team's achievement. I think it's a paradigm shift. So during meetings or discussions, maybe board meetings or operational meetings, one can even decide or opt to wait without voicing their opinion unless otherwise you're contributing something of legitimate value so that overwhelming need for significance would diminish when you uh, consider the overall objective of the organization and when you're trying to safeguard the interest of the company so when you really think that you're working to safeguard the best interests of the company, you tend to forego your ego. Uh, also, uh, when somebody is promoted from within an organization, like in my case, for example, that deep knowledge of personalities and corporate culture can be very helpful in understanding the behaviors, whether it's uh, sensing or intuition. Hence, would assist you in deciding on your approach to individuals with different temperaments. I think that tacit knowledge will reduce the time taken in decision making as you're concentrating on the facts which are on the table rather than the conflicting personalities or the problem at hand. So uh, strength of the individuals usually would, uh, would uh, help each other at a board level which would be a compliment actually. They would compliment each other and the weaknesses would be a board members or the, or the board could overcome the weaknesses of each other by making a group effort to uh, minimize the weaknesses or to overcome it in total. Also, when you look at the boards, uh, usually the boards comprises of strong personalities. So at times it could be a daunting task uh, to uh, arrive at a common ground, uh, not simply because it's uh, the because of the complexity of the issue what you have at hand or the nature of the task or the proposition. Usually, it's because of the varied perception of the individuals in the board. So, women by nature uh, act as uh, unifiers or collaborators for that matter, and I believe their level of emotional intelligence. Uh, whether it is uh, uh, trying to manage your um, uh, temperaments or to understand your own emotions positively, empathize with others and communicate uh, effectively, I think it's comparatively higher than our counterparts. So uh, this allows women to reduce conflicts and also to build 
stronger relationships. Being assertive is uh, not a negative form in this case. So I believe being assertive is about respecting each other in terms of decision making process and to uh, without compromising to come to the best possible level when you think of the overall objective of the organization. So there, uh, I think these traits of women would increase the cohesiveness of the board, which ultimately made the board extremely effective. Thank you very much, uh, Pavitra. Some very interesting thoughts and perspectives of uh, different kinds of behavior, knowledge, and the way you use it as you rise up in the organization. Uh, what you use to your benefit, what you have to be mindful about as you sit on that table. And a very interesting point on how you see assertiveness, uh, being assertive, being respectful, and uh, making your mark around the table. Thank you very much for that. And we're moving on to our uh, last panelist and to hear from a gentleman that really needs no introduction. Uh, and what we are going to ask uh, Hiran to share with us is how in an organization which has been there for many years and has seen leadership from different generations leading the organization and business forward, how over the years, has the company culture evolved to actually attract more diversity? And, the, and what has the role of leadership been in that evolution of the cultural changes that take place in an organization which has been around for many years? Hiran, over to you. Thank you, uh, Dinali and Ayubo, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I have to say I'm lucky to be in this panel because uh, I was the one on the bench. My sister uh, was uh, to be here, uh, but unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, uh, she's on the board of one of the leading banks in Colombo. So she had to attend a board meeting and some award ceremony. So as a result, uh, the bench boy is uh, participating and I'm, I consider it a privilege. You know, our company, as you asked, Dinali, the culture of our company uh, was set by the founder of, that's my father, uh, you know, many years ago. We are now 47 years in tourism. And uh, uh, he treated, I mean, you know, I have, I have one sibling, that's my sister, Shiro Mal, and he's, he treated both of us equally. So there was no <laughs> gender imbalance in, in the family to begin with. And from there onwards, it was, uh, it was quite easy for us to have uh, females in managerial roles. And it was actually in the year 2001, we had our first female general manager. There was a bit of a tussle as uh, the position was going to be in, in a hotel in Candy of the beaten crack. And can she handle it? Uh, it's more, it's more uh, you know, a place appropriate for a man than a woman. And then uh, there was a bit of a, uh, you know, discussions going on, but we said, hey, you know, let's let's ask her and see is she is she willing to take on the responsibility, and uh, yeah, she said yes, and that's how uh, things started changing uh, at Jetwing uh, from one female to another. We now have we actually had six female general managers, two have retired from service after working with us for uh, you know close to thirty something years. They have retired. Uh, and uh, the one who heads, uh, uh, the one who was the first to be the general manager is now on the board of Jetwing as a head of executive director of uh, Jetwing's uh, largest profit center before, of course, COVID, uh, the largest profit center that is Nigambo. Uh, she manages six hotels and uh, five uh, male general managers report to her. So for us, actually, we don't look at, is this a woman or a man? Is this person capable? Uh, if the person is capable, I think we have come to that uh, position now where we think, you know, we don't think is this a woman or a man. Just, just simply, is this person, does this person have the right capability, commitment, and then, uh, you know, we offer the position. We are grooming both men and women, young women, men and women to be fem uh, general managers of our properties. Uh, it is a task uh, for some of them. Uh, culturally, there's a huge issue. We manage two hotels in uh, Jaffna, for example. 
there are wonderful uh, ladies working there. Unfortunately, the moment they get married, the men ask them to just stay at home. So, uh, so we lose them. Uh, Sri Lanka loses them, hospitality industry loses them. And I think it's a shame. So I'm not sure when that culture of you know, protectionism or jealousy or whatever you want to call it will change. Uh, if that changes, I think we will have more very capable young women uh, taking on leadership roles. Uh, so, so in order to you know, get the whole culture change, I think the men will also have to change as well. Some of the thinking of men, especially uh, I, as a man, I can say that because uh, you know, if we don't change and allow, uh, uh, you know, first and foremost, respect, uh, allow them to work and accept that they are equally good and, and select the best. I mean, you don't have to select a person just because you're a female. I mean, I'm sure most of you in this panel and the ladies who are, who are listening to this discussion don't want to be selected to a board just because you're a female. You want to be selected to a board because you are the best. And, and let's hope one day there will be boards in organizations where there are more females and then you don't talk of gender diversity and having equal or whatever, you know, you would simply have the best possible board and on that board, you might have five females and three men, uh, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, I think, what we should be aiming for. I think it's good, good that uh, these discussions are going on, that the gender diversity discussions and more females are getting onto boards, uh, taking on more leadership roles. I think there is a lot more to be done, uh, especially in Sri Lanka. Culturally, we have to allow, uh, uh, you know, the females to take on more, more responsibility. The parents uh, have to also change their thinking and uh, move on. If, if that does not happen, uh, it will always be when you're young, you work. And then uh, after you get married, you stay at home and take on the responsibility, as someone said, of uh, taking care of the home and uh, children. I think that should be also the responsibility of both. So with that, thank you. And I look forward to participating in the other discussions later on with the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hiran, for sharing your experiences. And I, and I love that uh, story that you shared about how in 2001, you all were having this whole discussion about appointing a, a woman to take care of your hotels out in Kandy. And what I loved about your story is about all the questioning that's going on and then you all decide, let's ask her, let's ask her. And all the questioning that's going on is an example of what we refer to as unconscious biases. And these are biases that exist in men and women in an organization, uh, predetermined ideas that we have about who is best suited for a job and who is not. And this is a great way to go into the question and answer session uh, for this panel discussion. And what I would like to do firstly is uh, to get some thoughts and responses uh, to this question from uh, Sisli Pavitra and then uh, Shyamali. And what I would like to ask both of you ladies is picking up from the whole notion of unconscious biases, what are the effective strategies that you have adopted to mitigate unconscious bias and discrimination at the board level? So Pavitra, maybe you can begin and then Shyamali, we can go to you. Sure, thank you, Dinali. Uh, so I think uh, number one would be self-awareness. So it is important that we accept that uh, unconscious biases do exist. Uh, I think that's uh, where we have to start with. And uh, when you see these unconscious biases do exist, you all tend to agree and accept and take it forward with you. And your decision-making accordingly would change when you know and when you're self-aware of the situation. So when these biases usually happen, you, whenever you try to make decisions within a, a short period of time. So instead, uh, when we make decisions, and especially if you have figured out, if you have uh, made realize that you have biases within you, I think then you tend to apply a break and 
uh, think through or contemplate as to what exactly you're going to do with that decision and whether you're going to be biased or whether you're going to be discriminative in that decision making and you need to start there so i think being considered on uh, various aspects and uh, revisiting the decision making process mentally would allow you to take that time uh, and uh, give the right decision present the right right decision uh, to people without uh, being biased so also uh, right now uh, in in the current day and uh, age and in today's era what we say is that we are appreciating diversity and uh, different perspectives so in that case we have to understand that people come from different backgrounds and their walks of life are completely different. So we, are, we need to appreciate that diverse uh, views from people. And sometimes it can be extremely difficult to generalize it with uh, a gender uh, or even with a, a generation for that matter. Uh, so it, it would be a little different, but difficult to uh, generalize. But what you need to do, uh, I believe, is that to uh, your attitude towards how you look at the issue would also make a lot of difference. And the experience and the trait of openness, which will actually allow us to embrace diverse and new uh, ideas without discriminating. So that openness would allow you to look at things through and uh, in and out, and you would come with the best possible decision for your setup and as the case may be for the entire organization. And also, uh, for example, if you look at the, uh, the female representation at the board level, uh, usually when uh, what we observe is that when you attend a meeting or a discussion, maybe a board meeting or otherwise, they tend to do a lot of homework and attention to detail is something that you would always see. So it's quite easy for them to grasp and respond accordingly. And I think that process also will allow for you to be less discriminative or biased. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Pavitra. Shyamali would love to hear from you. Effective strategies you have adopted to mitigate unconscious bias and discrimination at the board level. Um, so I think knowledge is very empowering. And um, I've had instances um, where um, I know because I'm a woman, this has happened not only in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, there was an instance where I'm on a chamber and uh, when people didn't really who know who didn't really know who I was, um, I've had this question as, oh, are you representing the women's chamber of commerce? Um, for example, because that they thought was the only chamber that you know a woman could represent. And then I've had an um, I can give another example um, overseas at a conference um, where someone was asked, you, you know, don't you find uh, men in Europe? Um, not giving you the same respect because you're a woman and, and soon after that I had this incidents where I had this conversation and I, I saw that um, firsthand so I think um, to change this biasness it, in some respects women have to try a little bit harder and um, as I said knowledge is empowering you you have to be able to hold your own um, in any conversation you have to be confident and you have to to um, know the subject uh, matter that you're dealing with um, even more I, I think if, if I mean a little bit more even if possible because that confidence um, it, it's a confidence that you carry so I, I've been invited I, I, I'm, a, I'm on a family board um, which has its own nuances because you have generational issues but um, if I take a point when I've been invited to sit on boards I, I think the reason that has happened is, is because of the knowledge that I can and bring, and it is what I've been able to, to share at various opportunities that I've had. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shyamali and Pavitra, for, for your responses on the strategies that you have adopted in mitigating unconscious bias and discrimination at the board level and different perspectives in terms of, firstly, being self-aware and understanding what are the biases that you have, and then using knowledge as a, as a method of empowering yourself in those situations. Thank you very much for that. So moving on, we'd love to hear from the gentleman. And uh, in how can companies meaningfully and practically 
overcome the barriers that are present for women to obtain a board appointment. So to thought three, maybe we can start with you. What can companies meaningfully and practically do to overcome barriers that could prevent a woman being appointed to the board? Um, I think we, we are talking about a really senior position, right? Um, uh, we, we need to have a strategic differentiation um, compared to many others to get an appointment to the board. It has its own its own requirements. But I think in a, at, a, at a company level, it's very important that um, we have a platform uh, where we allow people to exhibit their strategic thinking and differentiation, these, the skills and capabilities that they have. Uh, we need to create a, a segue for promoting um, uh, gender diversity at all levels. And um, it actually has to start at all levels, right? It has to start from the junior positions all the way up to the senior positions before you get can get appointed to the board. And we have to position them, create a platform to position them properly and create enough visibility. The, uh, I think Mr. Kure was mentioning this earlier. Um, they, they get, uh, people will get selected, right? And they want to get selected basis, the, the capability that they have but creating a platform and a position, I think, is uh, is very important, and I think organizations should create that um, to have more board appointments, more than what we have got. Thank you, Tathatri. Hiran, your views uh, and perspectives on this? Yeah, I, I think I I think I mentioned a little bit in my earlier uh, five minutes as well. I'd like to see you know companies treat both men and women equally. Uh, this this brings me to a little story. It's actually not gender, but just on diversity. Uh, you know, most of the time when I have free time, I watch rugby and cricket. Uh, you know, and in 1995, take you back to 1995, South Africa won the World Cup rugby, and that time uh, they had a they had a they had created a person. At least one of the members must be black. So they, they found a young black boy and put them put him into the uh, team uh, South Africa. And of course they won the World Cup and you know, there's a huge, uh, there are movies made about, you know, late um, Nelson Mandela and so on, how he spoke to the captain, motivated the team and so on. But now look at the team after, uh, you know, 24 years in 2019, South Africa won again. And who was the captain? Uh, you know, boy from the slums and, uh, you know, half the team or more than half the team were, you know, blacks. And I would like to see that the same happen uh, to men and women. I mean, rather than say, hey, we want to have one. How do we create this? How do we create that? You know, treat men and women equally. I mean, you know, uh, and then there is no problem. Then, then you find who is the best person for the job. I mean, you know, is this man or woman capable of doing the job, right? There are, I mean, okay, I mean, Shia is in manufacturing, so there are certain things that requires manufacturers to do, and, you know, can they handle it? If that person can handle it, why not? You know, similarly in hospitality or anything else, uh, if, if the person is capable, so we need to change the mindset first. Once the mindset is changed, and I'd love to see within the next five to 10 years, we don't discuss this topic anymore. And we just have the best people doing the job rather than, you know, can we have just one female on our board? You know, is that adds color to the board? I mean, that's all nonsense to me. You know, it's just, just bringing the best person and, and uh, uh, you know, keep them, keep them on. So that's how I'd like to see. I'd like to see Asia changing that uh, thought process, thinking process as well. Families encouraging more females to join their businesses and all of that. So that, I mean, you know, Shia is a perfect example of that. Uh, my family also, I, I, I did say that my sister and I share equal responsibilities in the company. So that's the kind of uh, uh, thing that we'd like to see uh, in many other businesses, corporate world, as well as family businesses and so on. So that's my little two cents worth. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hiran. And, you know, interesting point that you made. You spoke about 
organizations, companies may be wanting to have that one board seat, one board seat, you know, for uh, you know for the lady. Research uh, has shown and research has proven that uh, a critical mass is needed around a, a, a boardroom to actually benefit from some of those business benefit indicators that we spoke about. And usually it's about three board seats, about 30% of, you know, of, of the board should be, should be women to try to kind of really see some of those business benefits coming in and those benefits in innovation and governance, etc. So one uh, is a good start, but is probably not going to cut it to see what we really want, what we really want to see. So I think that uh, would be a, a great way to uh, go to Sarah. And Sarah, I'd like to like to ask you, what metrics or key performance indicators can be used to influence the board members to have better gender equality on the board? And I think we've heard snippets of people's views and our panelists' thoughts, you know, on this. But having been in this field, working with many organizations, and I think Hiran, you spoke about the change. It's a change, that uh, mindset, a change that is needed in, in all of us. And change doesn't come about easily. And usually what gets, if you have something that's driving it, what gets measured gets done. So with that backdrop, Sarah, what are some of the metrics or the key performance indicators that, that organizations can have to better drive this process? Thank you so much, Denali. It's a, really an excellent question. Um, I think that, you know, we've heard so much this afternoon about mindset and the importance of, of, of a really deep kind of change. And I think all of the individuals that are, are I'm lucky to be on the panel with are really, you know, personifying being that kind of person who, who, make, who drives that kind of change and sets those kinds of examples. Um, but I think that key performance indicators and metrics can also play a really important role in just institutionalizing the change that we need to see happen and ensuring that it's sustainable and it, it becomes part of what a business is doing, that it gets integrated into the DNA of what the business is trying to achieve. So I think what we have seen in our work with you and women, where we've been privileged to work with many private sector entities trying to make change, is that there's a need for a quite a holistic kind of framework to actually make a systemic change. And the one that we've maybe been experimenting with the most is the women's empowerment principles, which we call the WEPs for short, which you probably many of you are aware of, um, is, which is a partnership of Global Compact and UN Women. And what I really just want to emphasize about that is that we've been working on a, a transparency and accountability framework to enable people to really institutionalize that, because I think that's the really key step. And then within that, we look at different kinds of metrics, some of which are um, we call essential indicators that really measure the irreversible positive changes. So it's it's looking at things like equal pay, equal opportunities. And then we also are looking at the complementary indicators, which really look at some of the key systemic barriers to women, women moving forward and moving up in the workplace. Um, so that is more tailored to the specific context that you're working in and that can really embrace perhaps trying to work on some of the cultural changes that a lot of the panelists have alluded to today and working with communities and working with the surrounding environment of the company um, as well as as well and, and really you know looking at this cultural shift that people have talked about which we all know is, is really hard to do but you know there are ways of breaking that down into practical actions as, as everyone's been highlighting and metrics are a very important way as you said for us to to know that we are doing that and that we're on track thank you very much uh, thank you very much sarah and uh, like what i thought uh, our our time has uh, flown by and uh, come come to an end unfortunately i know that uh, we could have uh, a lot more discussion on this uh, on this topic and share a lot more experiences and stories and uh, what i think is so inspiring is when i hear about what organizations are doing from the panelists here is the intention of uh, of driving this agenda is there everyone is taking steps uh, in the right direction and we're all really learning together to see how we could break these gender barriers in the boardroom so just bringing this all to a close and and summing up what we've heard today so we had 
Sarah, who shared with us very eloquently the business benefit of why we should be having better diversity of gender in the boardroom and the, the researched, proven facts and figures and data that goes to show that if you do have better representation in the boardroom, you in fact are going to have a much better business benefit and outcome, not just financial, just not just quantitatively, but also qualitatively. We then went, uh, heard from Shyamali, who spoke about the importance of thought diversity and some uh, very uh, interesting aspects that were that were that were shared in terms of creating that environment, making it nurturing, it making it empowering, so that your teams are able to. Um, to work up and, and rise up through the organization. Shyamali, you spoke about the importance of recruitment and what happens at that point of bringing these individuals in and then seeing them through. Uh, so thought three, in terms of the interventions and the interventions that the organization is uh, putting into play from career planning to mentoring to sponsorship, uh, the different development programs that will assist in making the changes that are needed and giving uh, the ladies and the women, the better their competencies and their skills and expertise that is required for them to kind of progress in the in the organization. And Pavitra, the, the kinds of behaviors that, that one needs as you get into the board, the importance of some using your tacit knowledge, the importance of leveraging on the relationships that you have built, the importance of putting your ego aside and not looking at it just from a functional perspective, but what's best for the for the business. And then here on looking at the cultural changes and the fact that in an organization which is old, which has tr strong tradition, the values of respect and ensuring that we use that to drive the changes that we need and that it is possible, even in an organization that has so much of depth and, and history and heritage wonderful learnings and uh, thoughts and experiences from all of our panelists. And I really hope that for the audience, it's, this has given you some nuggets, some takeaways of changes that you could bring into your organizations and in yourself. So in closing, I just want to talk a little bit, uh, just highlight the whole aspect of unconscious bias. It has come up in, in various of our panelists today. Um, there is a broken rung in many organizations, and that is usually when women get to that assistant manager, middle management level. They find it sometimes difficult to cross, and the growth becomes a, a lot slower than what it would have been. Uh, there's childcare responsibilities usually, there could be a lack of support that sometimes comes to play, and there are several unconscious biases that could come into play about who is suited for a position? What are the attributes that are seen as leadership qualities? What, who makes a better leader? What are those personality traits and characteristics? And these are very important to acknowledge and to address. And what women highlight as a risk or can, how they can manage a situation can be very different to what their male counterpart could also bring. But both men and women together in equal proportion in an organization can make give that organization that winning edge. So whilst we have all started on our journey, there's a lot more that we have to do. And I want to thank uh, the Global Compact and uh, uh, Making Global Goals Local Business for putting this on as a panel discussion to provoke thought and to provoke discussion in an agenda that is very, very important uh, in, in the world today. So thank you very much to our panelists, uh, panelists again. Thank you to the audience. I hope you enjoy the, the hour and the time. And we would love for you to stay on. Uh, we are going to be having our next panel discussion which is a business innovation in accelerating the sustainability development goals. And I'm sure that that panel discussion is going to be equally or more interesting. So thank you very much for your time and have a pleasant day. Thank you.